a real crime. In a series of podcasts, I want you to travel down some lonely roads with me. These are the roads I traveled with families who never got to say goodbye to loved ones. These family members were fated to live the rest of their lives waiting and wondering. I will begin this series with unsolved murders, but I will also revisit cases that include arrests because aspects of the case are worth re-examining. I wrote these stories when I worked as a reporter for the Charleston Gazette. Thanks for joining me today. As I approach almost one year of writing this podcast, I am looking back. Episode 43, The Old War Horse Remembers. As I mentioned before, as a reporter, I had an immediate affinity with covering court cases. I liked the living drama that unfolded before my eyes. In the old days, members of the public enjoyed coming to court to see the drama too. Sadly, almost no one does that now. Most judges require that all people who come into the courtroom must step through a metal detector or go through some other screening process to make sure they're not bringing weapons into the courtroom. This is a sad necessity, but it certainly makes attending a trial more difficult. I have covered circuit courts in several counties and also federal court. I'm happy to say I never saw a case where someone was found guilty who was not. But I also want to point out that most defendants in criminal cases are poor people. It is rare for a rich person to be charged in court, but when they are, they hire the best lawyers. One of the best lawyers I ever covered was the late Jack Swisher from Charleston. He was extremely sharp and had a good sense of humor. Like a prize fighter, he could jab, jab, jab. No opponent ever laid a glove on him. He was never at a loss for what to do next in any of the extremely complicated cases he took on. One of the best prosecutors I ever covered is Kristen Keller of Beckley. She's physically small, but big in her abilities. She was relentless in each case she prosecuted. Defense lawyers and prosecutors alike must be able to anticipate every move on the chessboard. If they are unexpectedly blocked in a move they want to make, they have much to lose. While it's admirable never to see an innocent person be convicted of a crime, I have seen a few people who were guilty escape that sentence. And several of the unsolved murders I've written about before have prime suspects who have never been charged. For the surviving family members, this is horribly frustrating. In these podcasts, each time I spoke a victim's name, I tried to say the full name. I might be the last person to speak those names again. I wanted to let the dead live again. In many cases, the victim's family members are also gone, so there's no one left who knew them in life, but I still wanted to say those names, to breathe life into them once more for those brief seconds. I am painfully aware of how sad most of the podcasts were each sat in a different way. I did four pa podcasts about parents who were cruel to their children. In my decades as a reporter, I wrote dozens of stories about how children were abused and neglected. I will always remember coming to Sojourner's Shelter in Charleston and seeing a little boy in a high chair celebrate his first birthday. His mother had fled to Sojourner's, a place where staff offered many services to people who escape violence. In the titles, I wrote the word invisible because too often children were. If they were invisible, they were vulnerable. If I could write about those perils and change them, I wanted to do that. I found it difficult each time I had to write about the Browning children in Raleigh County. Their parents could say in self-defense that they too were abused children. Two of the Browning children I wrote about suffered early deaths. For me, a bright side to these heartbreaking cases was meeting some amazing foster parents. Ruth and Robert Klein are the best of the best. They were always honest, patient, and thoughtful. They opened their home and hearts to dozens of children who were the better for the time with them. 
Sadness mingled with frustration in too many cases. I am sorry I never met Eddie Brown in life, but after he was murdered, I learned a great deal about him. He was the ideal employee, never missed work, and always arrived early. He wanted to open the gas station on West Virginia 61 outside of Oak Hill to give school children a warm place to stay until their bus arrived. He worked at a gas station, but never had a driver's license. He walked from his family home in the dark to the station. He was attacked as he walked the well-worn path. I have to believe two people were responsible for the attack. One had to be a man. Eddie was himself strong, and someone had to be strong to inflict the injuries Eddie suffered. But when Eddie arrived at work bleeding, he was holding a woman's blouse. I think a woman helped the man who attacked Eddie, then gave Eddie an item of her clothing to try to stop the blood. Eddie was known to carry cash in his pockets that he freely gave to people. His habits must have guided his feet. Even after receiving what would be fatal head injuries, he walked on to the gas station. No one has ever been charged with Brown's death. I can only think the person who attacked him has since died of shame. I also found it sad to write about a person who remains nameless and unclaimed to this day. I entitled that episode, The Great Unknown. Despite many efforts, the body that was found in suspicious circumstances near an Edis interstate was never claimed. I cannot imagine a loved one who's found but never connected to any family member. In our society, we say we value family, but too many women are beaten and killed by men who promise to love them. In all my years as a reporter and in this podcast, I felt it was important to shine light onto the subject of domestic violence that most usually hides in the dark. I never covered a case that featured a smart criminal. Usually defendants are accused of doing something incredibly stupid, cruel, or both. I know the right, the right Reverend Michael Flippo thought he was being clever when he reserved Cabin 13 in a remote state park, but as his plans unfolded to murder his wife, the events played out like a bad movie. Former principal Edgar Fredericks Jr. also believed that he was the smartest man in any room he entered. I'm sorry his misjudgment of his intelligence led to a child's death. And lastly, I'm thinking of, of Hank Williams. I wrote about his connections to Oak Hill, my hometown. I also wrote that it was a real crime that so talented a person died so young. I made him a subject of one podcast to illustrate the old coroner jury system in use when he was declared dead in Oak Hill. I lived outside of Oak Hill for about two years. In the summer, I always kept my bedroom window open. I enjoyed hearing a whippoorwill calling in the night. Without question, Hank's death is sad, but we can be grateful for the music he gave us in his brief life. The words he wrote and the timber in his voice go straight to the heart. Thanks as always for listening to Tommy Siner for his great work and to Brenda Pinnell for her amazingly tech her amazing technical skills. Please join me next Wednesday for another episode of A Real Crime with Susan Williams. 